In light of the fact that everything got quiet, it must be time to begin. Wonderful, wonderful to see you. There we go. It's been a while. We're in the book of First Peter. We're following the instruction lesson by the Winklers. And how awesome it is. The vast, vast amount of material that we have on each lesson. I find it staggering to even attempt to try to get through. We're on page 58 of the lesson book. The title of the lesson is Successful Living Results from the Christian's Hope. I hope that you are encouraged, as am I, when I just read the idea of the life that we live and the hope that we have in Christ. What an excellent thought. The hope. The best way, I think, maybe to accentuate the hope that we have is to look at life Without hope, I cannot fully grasp what a person who is outside of Christ, not following God, not a child of God, having Jesus ever by his side, I can't imagine the helplessness and the hopelessness of that day-to-day -day life. Facing trauma, trials, alone. But that's what they are when they are not in Christ. So contrasting that to us, not that we are magical, supported, wonderful, elite, uh, and yet we are elite. We are called. We are chosen. We are in Christ. But everybody can be that way if they will merely come to Christ. So tonight our goal is to accentuate what Simon Peter wrote. And it's always, again, staggering to even put this into words. He wrote it approximately 2,000 years ago. And yet it's just as if it's relevant right now. The Bible is that relevant. Let's go to our Father in prayer, and then we'll begin our lesson. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, how great, how powerful, how almighty you are. How wonderful it is. Of Simon Peter. Help us with open hearts and minds to listen carefully. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Is it on? All right. I heard it popping and I did not know if it was on or off.
I know that. No. I know that the Winklers have an abundant of material. But on most every book of the New Testament, I have kind of thoroughly have my own notes with each verse and highlighted thoughts under it. This book is absolutely one of the best when it comes to things that help us, lift us up, encourage us in a discouraging world. So initially tonight, I'd like to turn to my own notes and then mesh it together with what the Winkers have written. Simon Peter was one of the three at the resurrection. With his own eyes, he saw. Simon Peter was in Gethsemane the night before Jesus was captured. He was the one that drew his sword and cut off the ear of a soldier, Malchus. The one that Jesus rebuked and said, put up your sword. He was the one that said, I'll never deny you, Lord. But he denied him three times shortly thereafter. He was the one to whom Christ appeared after his resurrection. There was one time in Scripture when the Lord was talking to others, and I love and find uniquely intriguing when Jesus said, Go and tell Peter. I've often wondered why he didn't say go and tell John or go and tell James. He said, no, go and tell Peter. Peter had been the one that had failed, stumbled, and had fallen multiple times. I'm of the opinion, such as it is, not maybe worth the thought that I say it. I think the Lord was able to see what Peter would become not so much what he was. Go and tell Peter. In the context in which we find this book written, the first century, the conditions were pretty rough. Peter calls them strangers in this world. Pilgrims just journeying through. Chapter 2, verse 9, he says, You've been called out of darkness. Chapter 3 and chapter 4, Peter spoke about how they had been persecuted and severely. In chapter 2 and chapter 3, Simon Peter speaks about their faults and their sins. They were human. They were not living always righteous lives. And yet, <clears throat> in this epistle, when we read it now, years later, we find hope that is a dominant thought rises to the top of importance. Hope in Christ. We find the thought of it being extremely necessary, essential to grow. As a child of God, we've got to grow. It's Simon Peter in chapter 2 and verse 2 that said, As newborn babes desire 
the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. It is in these writings that Simon Peter likewise accentuates a righteous life, a pure life as a servant of Christ. And how that unrighteousness separates you from God. It's in this book also that we learn that God is no respecters, respecter of persons. It's in this book that we learn that husbands are to love their wives and wives, wives even can win their husbands who are not Christians. Throughout this, we read about Christ and how he suffered for us and left us an example. It's in this book that we can find, and this is important, the oversight of the church by elders and deacons. Information about it. The elders are not to be lords over the flock. They're not to be dictators, but leaders, and the membership to be followers. There's a place out in Maxwell, Texas, called World Video Bible School. I know the brethren there, the Canes, Ruby, and Mac. They're excellent men, and they have developed a series of studies on every book of the Bible. And in 1 Peter, <clears throat> their material has this contained. In this book, we see that process by the Holy Spirit, in by which the Holy Spirit, as the agent, uses the Word of God as the instrument to bring us into the likeness of Christ in word and thought and deed. I don't know how many times I've read that. And every time I do, I kind of have to pause and think, wow, that's so true. God, the Spirit, brought us this book. The Holy Spirit uses this, the book of God, the agent, as the instrument to form and shape us into how and what he wants us to be. That's the power of the book of First Peter. <clears throat> Let's look at the first verse. I know we've already looked at it a little bit, but a brief backward glance. Peter an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers, that is God's people, who were scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, this then. In other words, he's now calling Peter, he was known as Simon before Jesus renamed him. And now Jesus called him Simon. He was a servant. He was one that was given a mission similar to each of us. We are told to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every preacher. We are told to help those that are less fortunate than we. We are told to encourage and edify one another. We had a mission. Well, they had a mission too. <clears throat> and Simon Peter likewise was commissioned, here's what you need to do. Verse 2, according to the foreknowledge of God through the sanctification, sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace be in, unto you and peace be multiplied. 
He's talking to the elite, the saved, the chosen ones. Do you consider yourself in that category? I know that somewhat by nature, maybe we're a little hesitant to say, I'm a saint. I'm saved. But friends, we ought to be able to do that. My Father has washed away my sins. He has stated that I am one of the elect. Here, Simon Peter calls them the elect. Or in other words, chosen. Called, called out of darkness into the kingdom, the marvelous light of the kingdom of God. That's us. And he even tells us in verse 2 the process in which that was done through, and we might add, the contacting of the blood of Christ. Look at verse 3. When he says, and I, oh, we can never grasp the fullness of verse 3. I think it's one of the most entire, multifaceted verses in the Bible. Blessed, he says, be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which, according to his abundant mercy, in this book, the Apostle Paul speaks of mercy more than once. In Titus 2, for an example, in verse 11, Paul makes the statement, Having how that we have received mercy, and by the mercy of God, all in writing the Titus says it's by the mercy and the grace of God that He has brought salvation to each of us. Well, here He's saying it's by the mercy, the abundant, the overflowing mercy of God. He hath begotten us unto a lively hope. There's that word, hope. And he tells us how it's process, obtained. It's by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. When do we have hope? One writer said, summer, spring, sunrise, when we have a new baby, at a time of our wedding, even at the time of our death, any and all aspects of life from youth to death, the child of God, the one that has come to God submissively, has hope. I was recently asked to write a mass manuscript and to present a lesson on the title of Matthew 28, when Jesus said, I'm with you always, and my assigned topic was, in sickness. First of all, I jokingly said, why did you assign me that? I don't know anything about that. And grin. But in sickness, when we're kind of beat down, maybe feel like, when's this going to be over? When am I going to get past this bottoming out, being in the valley? But if we can strive diligently to see things clearly, we will really focus on 
the hope, even during times of being down. What is hope? It's been defined in a lot of ways. I love maybe better than any and all as desire plus expectation. We long for our eternal mansion. But it's not just a foolish desire. It's based upon the knowledge that we have here this lively hope as he mentions in verse 3. We have an expectation based upon what? God has spoken. God has promised. God cannot lie. Titus chapter 1 verse 2. God always does what he says. And he has said, we'll have a home with a soul. We'll have an entire inheritance if we do these things that he asks. But we not only have a desire but an expectation. Gavin, please. So that's just the last part of verse 3. There is no hope. If Jesus Christ has to be very gracious, who else is going to be very gracious? Nobody. Yeah. I have no doubt what you said is true, but I don't have a clue what you said. Uh, what I was getting at, and I was already prepared, but I meant to say this at the first that a couple of weeks from now I'll see somebody that I hope is going to help me with some hearing aid. But right now, if my response, I want your comments. I treasure, as a teacher, your feedback, your addition. It's always so valuable, every one of you. But if I don't hear it, can't respond. If I respond with something that wasn't even a second cousin of what you said, that's just the way things are right now. But please keep on adding thoughts and everything as you did. Any other thoughts or comments? Let me go quickly before our time gets away from us to chapter four, a uh, chap, uh, verse four. He has just said concerning that abundant mercy has begotten us a lively hope by the resurrection. To what? Verse four. To an inheritance. Wow. God has given, providing, planned, and reserved for us an inheritance. My name's written on it. Your name's written on it. And then you read it. To an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled. That's not going to fade away. Reserved in heaven for you. We cannot read. Those words, without as a child of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, without just maybe having chill bumps all over our body, to grasp that indeed, indeed He knows you by name, He knows you by your deeds and thoughts and intentions, and He's looked down and He said, I'm giving that person, Joe Tom Sandberg, maybe this inheritance. And no power, <clears throat> no devil, demon, nothing is powerful enough to take it away from us. It's reserved, it's not going to crumble. It's not going to decay. 
reserved in heaven for us that inheritance. Now follow with verse 5. Who, who are kept, that is guarded, by the power of God, through faith, unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Grammatically, three, four, five prepositional phrases. And each one of them has a beautiful additional compounding thought that is piling on to this lively hope that which is kept or reserved or guarded for us <clears throat> by God's power through our faith unto salvation that will ultimately be revealed in the last time. As you look at the original language, I never want to look at too much the grammatical aspects of it, especially in Greek. I can't, first of all, not that knowledgeable. But here we're talking about a present tense participle. And the reason I mention it is he's talking in a action in progress that is continuous and unfailing. It's not something that we do and then say, okay, I've done that and go off. No, 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 no. It is done and do it again and again. Continuously, it's like confessing Christ. We confess Christ to become a child of God. He's the true and the living Son of God. But we're to confess Christ continuously thereafter throughout our life. Likewise here. Action that is continuous. And then in verse 6, here's where we'll stop with my particular thoughts. As far as notes. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. He went, go to the end of verse 7, that the trial of your faith be much more precious than that of gold, that it be tried with fire, but not be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Christ. The Winters asked some questions. I'd like to actually go to the reason together part of it. Not the initial 12. We've covered all part of that already. But when they challenge us to discuss the biblical definition of hope and how it relates to our salvation, our eternal salvation. He speaks and answers that by saying that biblical hope carries with it the concepts of desire and expectation, as we've already mentioned. And thus, as a result, we not only hear of heaven, long and desire to go to heaven, but we are absolutely confidently expecting to go there. It's kind of similar to what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, the first seven or eight verses. We're in this tabernacle, this earthly form, but we have a home, not built with hands, eternal, God created. And thus that's how we, by our confidence, have that hope, uh, expectation of that place. Randy? I, I also see a lot of motivation in that. Number one, he says we are protected by God. We're not in this just on our own strength. Uh, 
and, and the idea of hope, that's what motivates. That's what keeps people going and determined to do their very best to live the Christian life day in and day out for the duration of our time here on earth. Absolutely. We're not in it alone. We don't stand as an island by ourselves. Oh, how horrible life would be if that were the case. Can you imagine facing very serious and consequential sickness without Christ? Talked to Snow yesterday and we spoke about that very thing. The encouragement to know that Christ is by our side. He said, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never depart from you or forsake you. And thus, that gives us that motivation that Randy just spoke about. But then, we kind of take that and walk to another step. In other words, that confidence is built upon this foundation. The redemption. The redemptive work of the Son of God. We can read in verse Peter 18, 19, 20, 21 about how that we were not redeemed by the blood of bulls and goats. Oh, but listen to the words, the precious words I'm of Peter employed to speak about how we were redeemed. He said, not by the blood of bulls and goats, but by the precious blood of the Son of God. It was Christ who was more than willing to lay down his life not resisting those Roman soldiers. Not reaching out in anger and retaliating against the mob of the chief priests who mocked him. But he obediently did the will of the Father and died to redeem or buy back us to reconcile us. We've been separated, tragically separated by our sin. But we were no longer away. We were now brought back by the redemptive work of Christ. Number two, by the gift of salvation that is provided by the grace and mercy of God. We alluded to that about five or six minutes ago. For well, the grace of God had brought salvation. God didn't have to do that. It was not that we were so marvelously holy and wonderfully great that he owed us something. Not at all. He loved us. He was merciful to us. Romans 5, 8 and 9 should humble us as we read that God, while we were yet, we were yet in sin, God commendeth his love to us of the gift of his Son. Not deserving ever, but by his grace. I know you've heard this likely many times before, but it really is such a powerful fact and truth, it's worth repeating. Grace and mercy, what does that mean? One of them means we deserve, because of our sins, to be punished, but we're not going to be punished. We really, because of our sins, don't deserve to receive the blessings of God, but we're going to receive the blessings of God. 
We don't receive what we are due. We don't, we're not due because of our life, what we receive. That to me, one of the best ways of defining mercy and grace of God. But then Simon Peter here, as he's talking about biblical hope, as he has done quite frequently, he talks about, he bases it upon one gigantic foundational fact. The resurrection of Christ. Were it not for the resurrection, we would have no hope. As a result of the resurrection, we have hope. Christ is called the firstborn from the dead. God raised him. That's even what Jesus said while he was walking on earth among his disciples. Frequently he would say, I will die. I'll be crucified. But God the Father on the third day will raise me from the dead. And that's exactly what happened. But because God did do what Christ said that he would do, that God said that he would do, and he did, I not only know that God's able to raise him from the dead, but he's able to raise me from the dead, and you from the dead. And that's when he says, for example, in John chapter 5, how that all, both good and evil, are going to be raised from the dead. One, unto the resurrection of life. The other, into the resurrection of damnation. Everyone will receive their due of the result. Matthew 25, though, maybe is the better. When beginning in verse 31 and culminating all the way down to verse 46, Christ is talking about some that have gone and visited, gone and helped, and helped others. And the disciples said, Lord, when did we do all those things? But Christ said, In as much as you did it unto the least of these, you did it unto me. And he said, There are those that did not do that. And then he contrasted the two in verse 46. These that were obedient, they will be raised to everlasting life. Those that did not obey, eternal punishment. In a short few words, verse 46 speaks about the two eternal places of abode. Eternal punishment eternal life. Number two, he encourages us to discuss the part that we play, and here's where maybe the meat of the lesson is for us tonight. The part that we play in protecting our hope. For the winter points out that living with such a passionate and fervent desire and to realize that it's not just a fantasy to understand that when God says something it's going to happen and God has told us you become a child of mine you walk into life. You continue serving me until death. I will give you eternal life. I believe it. I trust it. 
And you can too. Believe it and trust it. And thus, that is our part in protecting that hope. Let me contrast it. I have no reason at all in believing that I have hope, realistic hope, of going to heaven if I'm not a Christian. I have no reason to hope if I'm not walking in the light. My hope is in vain if I am not faithful to God as I near death. But you see, as I believe His promises, I trust His promises, I'm keeping my eyes on the goal. I'm even I'm imaginary, fictitious, if you want to call it, but I've got blinders on my eyes. I don't want to go too far to the right or too far to the left. I want to keep my eye on Him. Isn't that what the Hebrews writer says? After listing all of those who walk by faith, chapter 11, in chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, he says, I love the way he says this. After listing all these, and just slows into chapter 12, seeing that we're surrounded with all of this great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside the sin, the weight, that easily slows us down, bops us down, causes us to quit. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. If he stopped right there, that would be a sermon in and of itself. But he didn't stop there. Segway on into verse 2. Let us run with patience, he says. And in verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who endured the cross, despising the shame, and was willing to die even the death on the cross. I'm not only going to run the race, I'm going to lay aside the weight of sin that easily besets me. But I'm going to look into Jesus. I know he's the author and the finisher of our faith because he endured the cross in my stead. Simon Peter and the Hebrews inspired writer simultaneously as it were talking on one beautiful theme Salvation. How do we protect our eternal hope? Simon Peter, writing here, challenges Christians to gird up the loins of your mind. Can I put that into one word? He says, I want you to Think. Well, let's make two words. To think properly. To be spiritual beings is indeed the girding up of your minds. I have the imagery of a saddle on a horse, and you gird up those straps. You don't want to swing one leg, put that one leg in the stirrup, put it in the stirrup, try to swing your leg up over it, and the saddle will fall down on the side of the horse, and you fall on the ground. You want to have that hinged up where you can get up on that horse. I want to think so properly that I'm trusting the promises of God and thereby have that hope. But in the second place, where the Winkler points out, these words challenge us to not only gird up our minds, think, but to persist. 
We're not in a sprint. We're not in a 100-yard dash. We're in a marathon. It started at the time we obeyed the gospel and we entered that race. And that race is not through until we draw our last breath depart from this life. We've got to start right, continue right, and die right. We've got to persist in this race to reach the finish line which is the second coming of Christ for our death. We got to press toward Paul would say in Philippians 3 to press forward press toward the prize. I think in a previous study I pointed out and I found it amazing when I ran across this it's equivalent to, and we've probably all seen races on television or maybe in real life, where here's this individual that's running and running and running and running, and they see the finish line, and, and they're running so hard, the last few steps of the last hundred yards, and they're even pushing forward, and their head and their chest is kind of reaching out, they're pressing forward. In a similar way, we are toward the prize. We're pressing toward that prize. And we're living by running that race. Pure, sanctified, holy, righteous life. <coughs> Sinless life? No. If that were required, we'd never make it none of us. But you see, when I walk in the light available to me is that second law of pardon, which means as a Christian, when I must stumble and fall, I can ask God, confessing my sins, and pray to God, and He'll forgive me, and I'm blameless again. Pure. By the mercy and the grace of God, I continue to live a holy life. Praise God for whom all blessings flow. I want to pause at that point. I want, I know Randy's going to mention it. I've just got to say, do you realize it's two weeks from Saturday, our lecture day? We have updated brochures, he'll tell you about them in more detail, but I want to accentuate one point. The schedule is much more thorough. Each of the eight ones, the young men that will speak a short time, each, the title of their lesson is there. The ones that are going to read, what they're going to read is there. The ones that's going to lead a song, the song they're going to lead is itemized. We'll have all of these things on the projector. You'll be able to follow it, and it will disclose for that two and a half to three hours. I've talked to most of them today, or well, their parents won, and it's getting real and so close. But one final thing, and the main thing that I wanted to say, I gave each one of these speakers the theme. And I let them select and make the topic. I did not assign them a topic. But when I hear what they came back in, one of them, Walker King's going to speak on sin, need not win. Isaac Minor, the lukewarm Christian, Brandon Blackwell, God's son, reaching our soul's potential. Cole Doggett, 12-year-old, speaking out for the truth. Jonas Huger, an 11-year-old from the Chattanooga area, rise up and build. Julian Baker, being 
a Titus II church. Christ Woodard, weathering the storms of life, he throws at Snow's daughter, granddaughter Kayla's husband, offense or defense. It builds on the theme of building the Lord's church for the future. Thank you. Four six oh two. Okay. Four, six. Number four hundred sixty. Four hundred sixty. In light of all that we have discussed in our class, there's little else that I can add. Do you accept me to ask, do you have that hope? I know that your children of God, having obeyed the gospel at one time, but if that hope has waned, fallen short, or maybe it's died, renew that tonight. The biblical phrase that I love so much is your first love. And those that had fallen away in the first century were encouraged to return to their first love. If you need to do that, this song will encourage, bid you to come, and will gladly be oh so happy to help in any way. Won't you come as we stand and sing? Who at the door is standing?